So uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the University of Massachusetts, Boston. It is an honor to have Governor Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Murray, and Secretary Davey here on campus, along with all of you, for today's presentation regarding the future of the Commonwealth transportation system. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the legislature and the municipal leaders that are here today. Thank you for coming to your campus for this presentation. Our students, our faculty, our staff rely on our transportation system to get to school and to work on this beautiful Harborside campus every day. We rely on the T, we rely on the bus systems, and the commuter rail. We drive in on 93 or 128, and across the university system, in every region of this Commonwealth, we rely on the multitude of services to learn, to work, and to thrive. We all deserve a 21st century transportation system. Our students also deserve leaders who look for long-term solutions that will last for their lifetimes, rather than short-term fixes that will leave them with another mess to clean up. We have that kind of leadership in our governor, Governor Deval Patrick, a visionary with a commitment to this generation and the next. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for launching this conversation today at Boston's only public research university. We are honored by each of your visits. Feel free to stop by anytime. <laughs> it's also an honor when you choose our campus as the hot spot for one of your conferences and critical announcements. And so because you have something special to share again, I'm going to get out your way. But I'm going to turn the program over to John Jenkins, the chairman of the Commonwealth's Board of Transportation. John. Good afternoon. Um, and I am the chair of the board of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. We got the standing room only, Governor. And so um, I think the people, it says that the people are interested. Last year, the MBTA was faced with a significant funding gap, which would have required us to make deep cuts in service and to make significant fare increases. We held 31 public hearings across the MBT service area to discuss our plans with the public. The overwhelming message from those hearings was that the MBTA is a valued asset, we should limit service cuts, and we should limit the amount of fare increases. After the hearings, the legislature stepped in and provided additional funding to close the funding gap, allowing the MBTA to make fewer service cuts and moderate its fare increases. We thank you, the legislature, for that partnership through that process. As part of the assistance provided by the legislature, however, the Board of MassDOT was required to conduct six public hearings and submit a financing plan for transportation that would fix the system for the long term. Public hearings said to us that our customers wanted more of our service and not less. Uh, states around the country are facing the same kinds of transportation challenges as we are today. Aging infrastructure, deferred maintenance, and increasing demand for more and new services. The debate can no longer be whether to invest in our transportation system, but how to invest in a way that is responsible, adequate, and supports economic growth. The MassDOT board looks forward to what will surely be a robust debate of, of how that responsibility is fulfilled to the people of the Commonwealth to provide a vibrant transportation system for the 21st century. With that, I will turn it over to Secretary Davey for the detailed presentation. Thank you.
see if this, this works. Great. It's going to be a few minutes. So I'm going to take my coat off. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming today. My name is Richard Davey, Secretary and CEO of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. I'm going to spend the next 20 or so minutes talking in detail about the plan uh, that we will submit or have submitted to the legislature today. Before I do that, I want to mention a couple of things. First, I want to thank my staff. I am so grateful for the hundreds and thousands of hours that have gone into not only the hearings that the chairman mentioned earlier, uh, but also the work that's gone into what we think is a thoughtful, thorough, and transparent plan about how we move forward. The way forward uh, is the document that outlines exactly that, how we move transportation forward in the Commonwealth. But before we talk about the way forward, I think it's important to frame how far we've come in the last six years. So on, thank you, Cindy. So in 2007, when the governor, lieutenant governor came into office, uh, the Transportation Finance Commission, which there are some members here today, Steve Silver, in fact, the chair of that commission, came out with a report 90 days into this administration and said we had a gap of somewhere between 15 and 19 billion dollars for our transportation infrastructure. That was no new services, folks. That was just what we needed to invest in the system that we had. We had a looming swaption. Uh, which basically means we were, owed, we were owing banks $263 million without any way to pay for it, by the way. Uh, we had a broken system, and we were faced with credit down ratings because of where we were um, at the Turnpike Authority. And we had six different agencies, frankly, that didn't work together, that fought, and the last people they thought about was you, our customers. And that's where we came in in 2007. Next slide. What did we do? Working with the legislature in partnership, the administration took on a number of things. The Accelerated Bridge Program, a $3 billion investment, the largest statewide investment, let me repeat that, statewide investment in the Commonwealth's history around infrastructure. Uh, we had an immediate needs bond bill uh, to take care of other needs and issues around the state. We looked at other ways of reforming, uh, whether it was the Mobility Compact, which actually sat down those agency heads that didn't work together to find ways to work together, the Turnpike Authority, the Highway Division, DCR, uh, MBTA, et cetera. And then, with some assistance, we were able to stave off uh, some of the biggest crises that we had in 2007 and 2008, which were looming debt payments at the MBTA and operating assistance to the regional transit authorities to, again, stave off service cuts and fare increases. And finally, um, we were able to triple, let me repeat that, triple the investment that we were making, again, statewide. In 2009, transportation reform. And thanks to the governor, lieutenant governor's leadership, thanks to Chairman McGee and others in the legislature, we finally accomplished what so many failed to accomplish in the last two decades. Whether it was eliminating the GI, or eliminating 23 and out at the MBTA, the so-called generous retirement benefits, moving our employees into the GIC, the Group Insurance Commission, to save dollars, passed along to the, the Commonwealth, we were able to squeeze out inefficiencies um, and merge all these agencies that didn't work together. I tell a story that we did a press conference back in November with the chair of, uh, or the Highway Division Administrator, the CEO of Massport, the MBTA General Manager, and the Secretary of Transportation to talk about holiday travel. Those four people would never be in the room together except probably at a wake, and probably at one of their own wakes. This is how far we have come, and it is not an understatement. This is how far we have come in transportation. We are now unified and focused back on you, our customer, and improving your experience. Let me talk a little bit about, and the transparency quickly as well. Today, transparency in transportation, we have turned it on its head from, I think, some areas where we're the least transparent in state government, now to areas such as open checkbook at the MBTA, we now post on our website each and every Friday all of the maintenance activities that we have in the highway division, including the central artery tunnel. We are more transparent than ever before. But I want to get back to customer service because that is a place we've been very much focused on. For us transportation wonks and people who have been following this, collapsing agencies is important, GIC and 23 and out is important. But for the average customer, what has reform meant? Well, finally, it has meant rather than leaning down the platforms in the red or orange line, wondering when your train is going to come. Now we have subway countdown clocks throughout the system. 
How long am I going to be stuck in traffic? On I-93, you no longer have to know. We are giving you real-time traffic information. This is a good one, by the way. Seven minutes, five miles. <laughs> we need more of that. That's what this plan is going to do. Um, giving that and rolling that out uh, statewide. And finally, mobile ticketing. I am also happy to announce that as of this, uh, yesterday, we sold our 100,000 ticket on this mobile application for commuter rail. We rolled this out over, just over 60 days ago. And our one millionth dollar of sales will be done tomorrow uh, as a result of this. We are the first in the nation. So going from the last in the nation to the first in the nation in transportation is what we've been focused on. But, um, and through our public process, reform is clearly going to be ongoing. We are not stopping uh, with reform and what we've done with the tools the legislature has given us. So whether working with our partners in labor, uh, pushing forward on all electronic tolling uh, to make it more efficient for our, employee, or for our customers and to save money, uh, whether it's continuing to improve the registry of motor vehicles and how we're rolling out our services, more self-service soon, and much like a bank account, being able to log on and see exactly what your registry account looks like, these are the things that we'll be implementing over the next few months. Asset management and performance management. We've done some good work here, but we need to take it to the next level, and we are. And finally, as I mentioned, Massport, partnering with Massport, uh, continuing to do that. We've had a very successful uh, relationship with Massport over the last several months, particularly with Silver Line service, free Silver Line service from the airport to downtown Boston. However, I've said this before, the governor has said this as well, the current system we have today we cannot afford. And the one that we heard, we continue to hear from our customers, from you, we absolutely cannot afford. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Next year, we face about a $685, $84 million operating deficit all in at the DOT for three principal reasons. That was three, three principal reasons. One is for the last two decades, the highway department has been paying for operations off the capital bond program. What does that mean? It means mowing the lawn on I-93, we are paying for off the state credit card. And that has been going on since sometime in the mid-1990s. We must end that. For every dollar we spend today on operating costs on the state credit card, it will cost the taxpayer $1.76 to pay for that over time. That is not a prudently fiscal way to manage our business. The MBTA faces significant operating deficits because of its large debt burden it holds. And over the next five years, it will continue to peak. And if we don't deal with that uh, question, the MBTA will continue to have to roll back service and increase fares. It will not exist as we know it today. And finally, our 15 regional transit authorities, which we fund in arrears, meaning what? Meaning we have to borrow, RTAs have to borrow in order to fund themselves, and the state picks up the tab the next year. In addition, the RTAs, the regional transit authorities, have not been able to expand service in any meaningful way across the Commonwealth because of stunted growth. We all told these three items, getting uh, the capital employees off the bond, or, or the operating employees off the capital bond program, assisting the regional transit authorities, and once and for all solving the T is what we're facing. Next slide. Um, in addition, uh, what we're talking about is not only the operating side, but the capital. What do we need to invest in the current system we have today to bring it to a, quote, state of good repair? State of good repair essentially means that the asset, the road has no potholes, the bridge can take any trucks coming over it, uh, that the MBTA and the RTAs have new buses and new trains. That is what we seek to do over these next uh, 10 years. And thus, a proposal to spend almost $9 billion on our st structurally deficient assets today is what we need over the next 10 years and part of our plan. Let me explain each in detail. First, on the highway side, investing in our bridges. We have, as mentioned, a very successful accelerated bridge program. That program is winding down in 2016. Using that model as a way to continue to invest in bridges across the state, including municipal bridges, by the way, looking at our roads, again, opportunities to not only do simple things like paving, but improve markings, widening roads across the state to reduce the crashes, uh, crash intersections that we have, and to improve the customer's experience. 
In addition, as part of that, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, DCR, uh, we would also fund uh, critical improvements for their roadways that they own and maintain as well. Regional projects. There are three main regional road projects that we specifically call out in this plan. One is the I-91 viaduct in Springfield. By far the largest project, the biggest need in this state, and we do not have identified funding. We must do something with that viaduct in the next five years. And then for 93 and 95, the most congested and one of the most congested interchanges in this state. If you haven't driven uh, through I-93, 95 and Woburn lately around rush hour, I discourage you from doing so. It is that crowded, 400,000 cars a day. We have to find a way to upgrade that, as well as the one uh, in Canton. A couple other ones I want to mention, a bike and ped program. The governor and lieutenant governor announced a very aggressive mode shift goal uh, by 2030. We have to find ways not only to improve our road and bridge uh, system here in the state, but also find a way to get folks out of their cars and whether they be recreating or in fact commuting on bike and pet amenities. Looking at that across the state, we have a, an ambitiously funded program uh, for those. Facilities, technology in particular, we talked it about earlier, real-time traffic information, getting that out across the state and not just on I-93. And then finally, and most importantly for our municipal partners here in the room, um, is adding to Chapter 90. Uh, we have heard from our uh, municipal partners loud and clear that while we are at a historic high of $200 million per year for road and bridges, it is still not enough to do what you need to do at the local level. So what we propose is to add an additional $100 million each year for the next 10 years uh, to take care of those issues as well. On transit, significant investments need to be made on transit. Uh, the GTS backlog of state of good repair is widely known. The RTA's uh, backlog of state of good repair is not widely known. And let me talk briefly about that. Uh, the red line, we propose to purchase on behalf of the MBTA new red and orange line vehicles. The red line is running cars that were built in 1969. They are the oldest subway cars in the United States that do not have a retirement date. The orange line, every single one of them was built in 1979. We have to purchase new vehicles in order to ensure that we're servicing our customers today and making sure that growth along those two corridors is accommodated for the future. And we propose to build those cars here in Massachusetts. Uh, bus replacement. The M you can clap, that's fine. <laughs> Someone has stock in rail vehicle cars, apparently. <laughs> um, buses, uh, the real bread and butter of our entire transit network across this state. The average age of a bus at the, in the MBTA is about eight years old. The average age of a regional transit bus is older than that. We have to make sure we're infusing new equipment uh, for our customers so that there's reliability, there's less wait times, there's less breakdowns, and there's more service that can be provided. We propose that as well. And then upgrades for the MBTA power. What does that mean very quickly? It means the reason why your subway car is probably breaking down between Alewife and Harvard or Park Street, Mike Widmer, who takes the red line every day um, and calls me when they break down, by the way. Um, that's one of the reasons. The power and the signal systems, it's the, the unglamorous stuff that the governor says about infrastructure, the unglamorous stuff that we need to invest in so that the commute is more reliable. And lastly, uh, a plan to think about the future. So not only investing today, but thinking about the future. Uh, bus rapid transit is really the transit of the future. Having dedicated lanes and dedicated buses on our streets, it's cheap cost of capital. And DMU service, diesel multiple units, what does that mean? It means basically taking subway cars and running them on commuter rail. So rather than making significant infrastructure and capital investments here in the state, using what we have, but using it uh, more smartly. And then finally, a couple of modest investments in our airport infrastructure. Those airports not owned by Massport, but our smaller airports across the state that, as we talked about earlier, are such an economic engine in places like Westfield, in places like Stowe, making investments uh, in airports across the state. And a modest upgrade for the re registry to bring the registry into the 21st century. Next slide. But alone, 
that does not, that does not support the growth strategy of this administration. Um, we are proposing to make targeted investments across the state that unlocks job growth, that unlocks economic opportunity. And the three examples you see up here are a testament to when the state makes a small investment in a project, it can really unleash the private sector uh, to make significant investments. So whether Mayor Curtitone, whether it's Assembly Square, which you know all too well, a modest state investment is unlocking significant opportunity. Uh, exit 8B Mayor in Fall River, again, opportunity uh, across the state. And finally, uh, what we're doing on the Knowledge Corridor to bring rail service, real good rail service, back to uh, the city of Springfield, north and south, into Connecticut and up to Vermont. Those are the kinds of investments uh, that make sense and the kind that we're going to talk about uh, now. So, six areas of strategic investment that we're proposing to make in addition to taking care of all the things that we do today. First, South Coast Rail, a project that has often been talked about but never been funded. Um, this administration proposes to fully fund the South Coast Rail uh, connecting the fourth and fifth largest cities in this state to its capital. Two, the Green Line extension. Again, an oft-talked-about commitment uh, that even our latest predecessor signed an agreement on and left office without funding. We propose to fund the Green Line extension to Somerville and Medford. <laughs> South Station expansion. This is really a regional question for the Commonwealth as opposed to just a question about Boston. If we are to add more service to Worcester, to Fall River, New Bedford, and other places around the state, and frankly, outside of the state, if we're to have better inner city passenger rail in this state, we have to expand South Station. It is basically full today at rush hour. Every 60 to 90 seconds, a train is coming in and out. And if one thing goes wrong, it is jammed. And if we want to add more service, we have to be able to accommodate it with an expanded uh, South Station. And then three regionally significant rail projects. Finally, looking at the inland route, the so-called inland route, between Boston and Worcester, Worcester to Springfield. We'd make an investment, significant capital investment, to bring rail east-west in the state. And then two other areas. The Cape, we recently announced with Tom Kehare's help, service to the Cape uh, for seasonal service. We look forward to that being wildly successful. And we would make a small capital investment to make sure we could continue that going forward. And rail. Pittsfield through Connecticut to New York, reestablishing a rail connection. We'll get into each of these uh, very quickly uh, to uh, unlock opportunity in the Berkshires. So again, South Coast Rail, uh, for those who are skeptical, this is a $500 million in annual uh, economic activity that we would unlock with almost 4,000 jobs. And, and again, connecting the fifth and fourth largest cities to the capital of the Commonwealth. Two, as we said, the Green Line extension, a commitment that we have already begun to meet, but this will allow us to fully fund this commitment and bring uh, to one of the most urbanly dense corridors in the United States, for that matter, uh, true um, high speed and transit options and opportunities. As we mentioned, uh, South Station, not only does it unlock lots of regional opportunities, but it unlocks potential development in downtown Boston and reconnects the city's waterfront uh, through Dorchester Avenue. Passenger rail, as we mentioned, from Springfield to Boston, a $360 million capital investment, double track signal, again, all that unglamorous stuff, but that will allow us to unlock opportunity between Boston, Worcester, and Springfield, the three largest cities in the Commonwealth. Cape Rail, as we said, we're looking forward to unlocking tourism opportunities um, and economic opportunity down the Cape with a $20 million investment. We believe that we could make that permanent. And then finally, rail uh, from Pittsfield through Connecticut to New York City, reinstating what was um, a significant rail corridor and unlocking not only tourism opportunities in uh, the Berkshires, but also uh, economic and job opportunities uh, in the Berkshires. Now, um, folks may say, all right, this is nice, but there are a lot of projects uh, that we are not proposing to fund under this plan. Uh, we chose not only to fund what we have today, a significant portion of what we have today, and then strategic and targeted investments across the Commonwealth, but there are a number of worthy projects that we are not proposing to fund in this plan. Uh, here are three, the North-South Rail Link, the Blue Line Connector, the Urban Ring. There may be opportunities in the future, but the strategic uh, play that we want to make um, were the six projects uh, that were 
were previously mentioned. Now, that is the vision. That is the vision of where we want to take the Commonwealth when it comes to transportation. I want to spend a couple minutes with you giving you a primer of the pro forma you have in front of you, what this all means in terms of finances, um, and spend a couple minutes walking through what we think is a very thorough and very solid uh, plan uh, to move this forward. To give you a sense of, of MassDOT today and how we are funded, this gives you a sense. 21 cents in the sales tax, uh, excuse me, the gas tax, which yields $662 million. That was last raised in 1991, folks. The gas tax worth today is about 12 cents. So while costs have been rising over the last 22 years, our main funding source has declined. And the consumption of gas, by the way, in the Commonwealth has largely remained stable. Um, we get a portion of the sales tax, as you see. We obviously collect registry fees um, across the state. We also uh, collect uh, tolls, of course, and then other revenues, real estate, and a few other items at the DOT. Um, and as we mentioned, the pro forma uh, that, we, we will, that folks have that we'll walk through just a very bit uh, talks about uh, our expenses and where the dollars are going, how we're spending the dollars, um, and where we expect those dollars to be spent over the next uh, 10 years. So quickly on expenses, and again, the balance sheet you have in front of you does not include headcount or expenses at the regional transit authorities or the MBTA. This is just strictly the DOT. Um, we spend almost $229 million on payroll. Uh, you can see services, materials, back office, um, et cetera. The important part of this, folks, is that this does not represent the headcount that we are paying for off our capital bond program. This is merely operations. Another 200 and some odd $50 million for operations is spent off our capital bond program. Um, and then other expenses. We've been providing over the last several years to the MBTA, particularly debt relief. Uh, we provide uh, assistance to the regional transit authorities. But as discussed earlier, not enough to do what people expect us to do, which is to provide more service and better service and more reliable service. Next slide. Where do we spend it? Almost a billion or over a billion dollars of transportation revenues today go to pay for things we bought already, we built already, or services that were rendered already. And that is the reason why we're confronted with this challenge today. Uh, we rely, we pay so much of today's revenues for things that were already purchased, whether it be the big dig, whether it be the, the turnpike, or other uh, infrastructure improvements of the state. Good investments, but nonetheless investments that were not paid for in the long term because they've shortchanged what we have to do today. And here's the deficit that we face. If we do nothing, if we do nothing, uh, we're looking at a $3.3 billion deficit over the next 10 years. That's just maintaining the system that we have today. Uh, that does not remove those employees off the capital bond program, meaning for every dollar we spend, it costs $1.76 means the regional transit authorities are still skimping along, uh, attempting to run good service with very few resources. And it continues a cycle at the MBTA, which will be annual fare uh, increases, service cuts, um, unless we address this problem going forward. So all in, our, pro our program, our $13 billion investment program that we talked about, highway, infrastructure, rail, and all the improvements we want to make across the state, plus to address finally and once and for all uh, the issues at the MBTA and the RTAs and highway will cost about a billion dollars a year over the next 10 years on average. That will go up as we ramp up the capital program that we've suggested, but that's about what it costs. So we are proposing, in order to move the Commonwealth forward, uh, not only to address these long-standing operating issues, but to essentially double the capital program that we have over the next 10 years, taking it from about $12 billion, adding the 13, and going to about $25 billion. And that will allow us to make strategic investments across the state, will allow us to ensure that the condition of our trains, our roads, and our bridges to, that we have today are in a place 
that we have reliable service, less traffic, uh, and safer roads. Um, and how we fund it, a couple of things that we talk about, not only in the plan, but I want to mention today. Um, as we've said, reform continues at the DOT. And so one way we expect to uh, bring some dollars to this equation um, is the elimination of manual toll collection across the state. We project that that will save the DOT $50 million per year once fully implemented. We also, I think as a board, uh, would expect that over the next 10 and 25 years that we would have regular but modest increases uh, on registry fees, on tolls, and on fares. And then finally, uh, the legislature has granted uh, transportation a portion of new gaming revenues that are expected to come in um, in the next several years. That too will help reduce that billion dollar delta uh, that I mentioned. But that alone is not enough to do what we have outlined uh, for you today. With that, um, I want to spend just one more minute, and that is to say you saw a lot of numbers in front of you. You have a large spreadsheet in front of you with more numbers perhaps than one may want, except my chief financial officer who has cuddled up with this and enjoys it. But um, this is not about numbers, folks. This is about people. Um, and we've had over 50 hearings across the state in the last 12 months, whether they be at the MBTA, uh, whether they be out regionally uh, to listen to folks about this plan. Uh, and it is clear to us that what our customers are asking for is more. Uh, what they want is more reliability, they want more services, and we have to find a way to do this. So don't be, uh, uh, don't have an illusion about the numbers. This is ultimately about our customers and about serving citizens around the Commonwealth. With that, um, I'd like to invite uh, Governor Patrick up to, uh, to respond to what we've presented today. Governor? Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for that uh, really important uh, presentation. I want to thank the chairman and the members of the board, the secretary and their team at MassDOT for uh, preparing a very thorough and a very thoughtful plan. I encourage everyone to take the time to read it and to reflect on it. It's available online on uh, MassDOT's website. Um, take some time with it. They've taken a lot of time with it. Everyone knows that a comprehensive transportation system is vital to supporting and growing our economy. Workers needed to get to their jobs, students needed to get to school, tourists needed to get to the sites, police and firefighters needed to get to emergencies, business people needed to get to their appointments, people needed to get to the doctor, to the grocery store, to the movies, to the gym or the rink. Whether it's good roads, reliable commuter rail, frequent bus or subway service, a nearby airport, or a convenient ferry, transportation is about more than moving from point A to point B. It's about quality of life, economic activity, and growth. It's about opportunity. We have people in our Commonwealth whose opportunities are constrained by substandard service, and people in our Commonwealth whose opportunities are constrained by lack of access. Improving our transportation system is key to meeting our economic potential. This is not the view of just the transportation experts. It's the view of businesses and the employer community. It's the view of economists. Most of all, and most important of all, it's the view of the general public. In 17 public forums all across the Commonwealth and in countless encounters, frankly, that any one of us have had and can recite, Thousands and thousands of people have weighed in. What they tell us, as the Secretary said, is that they want more transportation, not less. They want subways that run later into the evening. They want regional buses that run on the weekends. They want bridges that are safe. They want projects that are built more quickly, like the Fast 14 experience we had uh, just recently. They want safer, smoother roads that are more comfortable to drive on and bring less wear and tear on their cars and trucks. They want access to jobs, affordable housing, and recreation. What the public wants, a modern, convenient transportation network, and what the Commonwealth needs, accelerated, sustained economic growth, are exactly aligned. 
The presentation we just saw is stark, clear-eyed, nonpartisan, and above all, fact-based. Fact-based. The results confirm two things. That there is not sufficient funding to support the system we have today. And second, that there is not sufficient funding for the system the public wants and the Commonwealth needs. We have known that for years. That even after the many efficiencies and reforms MassDOT has captured, we would need new revenue. Now we know just how much. It will take a total of $1.02 billion in new revenue annually, both to properly operate the system we have today and to make the modest strategic expansions we should have to accelerate economic growth. The other stark fact this plan reports is that if we do nothing, the public will have to pay more and get less, and our economic growth will slow in greater Boston and stall out in other areas of the state. And so I accept the plan the board has presented today as a necessary stimulant for growth, and I welcome the debate on how we make this vision for a 21st century transportation network reality. Thanks to this report, we can and should look forward to a fact-based debate. MassDOT has given us a menu of different means by which to make the necessary investments. At the State of the Commonwealth on Wednesday and in my budget proposal next week, I intend to submit my preferred means. Whatever funding mechanism we ultimately choose, I believe we must, uh, it must be comprehensive, dedicated, and competitive. First, it must be comprehensive. What do I mean by that? We can't settle for a solution that just stabilizes the T, as important as that is. We have to pay the bills we've already accrued for the big dig, fix and modernize what's broken and old, and invest in ways that unlock economic potential. I cannot see myself supporting any so-called solve for transportation that doesn't make investments in each of these kinds of areas. Second, the mechanism we choose must be dedicated. MassDOT has given us a 10-year roadmap to a 21st century transportation network. We need a revenue source they and their successors can depend on, and that won't be diverted to other good ideas before this agenda is complete. And third, it must be competitive. We know we will have to raise new revenue. Let's do it in a way that keeps any tax or fee within range of what other competitor states also charge. These are the principles that will be reflected in my own proposal on Wednesday. These are the principles that I will look for as we exchange ideas and work together toward a good solution. What's as plain as day is that we have choices to make. We can choose to invest in ourselves, to invest in a growth strategy that has proven time and again to work, or we can choose to do nothing. But let's be crystal clear and honest with each other. Choosing to do nothing is a choice, too. That is a choice. And that choice has consequences. It means longer commutes, cuts in services, larger fare and fee increases, and a continuation of the self-defeating economics that leaves large parts of our population cut off from opportunity and growth. I choose growth. I hope you will, too. I choose shaping our own future rather than just letting it happen to us. I hope we're all ready to make that choice, and I look forward to working together with each and every one of you to do so. I want to invite the Lieutenant Governor to make a couple of comments, and then all three of us or others would be happy to take any questions you may have. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Governor asked me if I wanted to say a few words. I usually say no, but uh, on this day, uh, I want to say yes. And I think uh, first, thank you to Secretary Davey and his team, John, uh, and the board for really a very detailed uh, plan. Uh, and to Cindy, part of that MassDOT team, the, and the communications team, for helping us begin this incredibly important conversation. Uh, and the fact that we've got this turnout, I think, underscores that people recognize how important this conversation is. I have said time and time and time again that our transportation network 
is really the enabling network of our economy. It cross-pollinates where people can live, work, and seek an education. And when we do that, it creates jobs and economic momentum. There are numerous examples of that across uh, the state. The highest priced real estate in and around Boston is around South Station. That transportation center is also fueling the innovation district. In my own city of Worcester, uh, Union Station has led to unprecedented private sector investment in concentric circles around that station. Uh, Mayor Koch uh, Grand, on, the, on the Quincy Concourse, uh, Mayor Warren uh, on Riverside, uh, Mayor Sullivan, whether it be Weymouth uh, Landing with the Braintree and the Weymouth Line, uh, Mayor Di Maria can talk about the, the River's Edge with Everett, Malden, and Medford. Uh, Mayor Driscoll can talk about uh, what the transportation the new garage uh, and the investments in our ports is meant for Salem. Uh, Pittsfield, whether it be Stanley Park, each and every one, uh, representative and mayor in this, uh, here with us today, uh, Senator McGee about the, the port and Lynn. These investments unlock jobs, and that is a major part of what our job growth strategy is all about that the governor uh, has talked about. Uh, and it makes a difference in those communities, but it makes a difference for individuals and families. I was with General Manager Scott and Secretary Davey uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Acton. As we were putting the shovel in the ground for a new train station along the Fitchburg line, which is being significantly upgraded and already leading to private sector investment that's much needed in, in downtown Fitchburg. And as I was leaving, one of, Senator, one of Senator Joyce's constituents who worked for a construction company working on the job pulled me aside and he said, I want to say thank you for what you and the governor and the legislature are doing. I said, for what? He said, you have kept me employed and people in my company employed working on these projects over the last several years amidst the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. And the fact is, folks, these projects that they're working on, it's, they're not make busy work. They're projects that need to get done. And the path forward that has been laid out uh, is a way for us to do that responsibly and in a way that ensures our generational responsibility that Governor Patrick talks about so often. So thank you to the team and let's begin this conversation. I think that works. I think we'll take oops, not. Let's try this. I think we'll take a few questions or comments if folks have them. Steve, since I called you out, I'll let you be the first. Governor, Lieutenant Governor, I want to just uh, thank you uh, for keeping the focus on this issue. I know the, the, the issue of transportation finance has, has brought you more uh, pain and heartache than, than uh, cookies and cream over the, the terms of your administration, so it's not easy. Uh, there are many of the members of the Transportation Finance Commission here, uh, Mayor Sullivan, Mike Widmer, Al McDonald, John Porbe, Paul Regan, Frank Tramatosi. And so, uh, Mr. Secretary, we want to congratulate you and your staff on the hard work it took to put this report together because we understand, like few others, exactly what it takes to do something like this. And I hope while today is, is described as a beginning, it can, can in fact be an end to the discussion on whether or not there is a problem with transportation finance and whether or not we need to address it. We do need to address it. Doing nothing it isn't a choice. Doing nothing is just choosing to let somebody else solve the problem. So while there's lots of room to have lots of debate on how we're going to solve this problem, uh, I want you to know that, that there's certainly uh, all the people in this room represent thousands of other people who are ready to work with you to find a meaningful solution to our transportation issues. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Mayor. Mayor. I just want to take a moment uh, on behalf of the entire city of Fall River uh, to commend the governor, lieutenant governor, and the secretary for committing uh, to have South Coast Rail funded. For decades, governors came to our region and had promised us rail service, whether it be Fall River, Taunton, or New Bedford. And by providing service to our region, it promotes economic justice and social justice. So I pledge our support as a region moving forward to help you get your plan passed through the legislature. Uh, and this plan hopefully uh, will allow us to take the train uh, to Boston, improving jobs for our community, improving access for education, 
and improving social justice for a region. So, Governor, I want to commend you uh, for this support, and uh, hopefully this project does move forward. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Scanlon. As I believe the longest serving mayor in the room and a civil engineer by training, I could not agree more. This is the most important thing we could be doing. And when we don't fix these things, like the roads, the cost to fix them finally goes up geometrically. So even if people refuse to do what you're asking them to do, it's only going to get worse and more expensive. I hope everybody will get behind this because there are no magic carpets. It's going to require all kinds of money and work to make the transportation system what it needs to be for the Massachusetts, state of Massachusetts, to be what it ought to be. Please don't waver. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Questions? For, it's hard to see the media. I don't, Janet, do you have a question? You want the microphone, Janet? Uh, Governor, is there any way to uh, raise a billion dollars a year without affecting virtually every citizen in the Commonwealth? I say, mean, say the first part again. Is there any way to come up with a billion dollars a year to fund this pl plan without affecting just about every citizen or every taxpayer in the Commonwealth? And uh, the second part of this question is, do you think you have support for such a plan in the legislature? Well, first of all, on the, uh, on the question of, uh, of every taxpayer, this is about every taxpayer. So I don't think it is a, uh, it ought to be a question about how to avoid um, who shares in, uh, in lifting this burden. This is a burden we all share. And by the way, as I said in my remarks, it's not just about transportation, it's about growth. Um, we have to commit to growth. We have to shape that growth uh, and not leave it uh, to chance. And investing in a 21st century transportation network is a key element of, uh, uh, of that. I think there is, um, not just in the legislature, but in the broad public, to, your second, to the second part of your question, support for the elements of this plan. I think that the means uh, and mechanisms by which to pay for it, um, and I, as I say, will prom uh, uh, propose my own preferred means on Wednesday, um, there's room for debate about that. Um, some pieces or some options in the menu that MassDOT uh, uh, has proposed are more appealing to me than others. They may be more appealing to, uh, uh, there may be other elements of it that are more appealing to, uh, uh, to others, and we will work our way through that. But the reason for talking about the plan and the elements of it first is so that we can have a really serious uh, conversation uh, with each other about whether these are the right elements of, uh, of the plan. John? Uh, Governor, since we're laying the groundwork today for, to promote political support for the tax increases that are to come, to what extent has our bad public memories of the financial fiasco of the big dig a problem and how do you propose to address that? It's a great question and an important one. And I, I might ask uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor and the Secretary to, uh, to add. I'll just tell you, uh, my view is that, um, you know, you, we were at this meeting the other day. Do you remember the Jobs for Mass meeting? Do you remember what Larry said at that meeting, Mike? Uh, Larry Summers was making a presentation about uh, fiscal issues, and he talked about how um, sometimes he gets into debates with his daughters about uh, the visa bill. And he said, you know, sometimes uh, he said the choices are either I pay it or my daughter pays it. He said, but a choice is not to stiff visa. Um, so, I, you know, I wish we didn't have uh, the bills from the big dig. Um, but we have the bills from the Big Dig, and they need to be paid. Uh, and they need to be paid in a, uh, in a serious way and not by just sort of, you know, rejiggering uh, the, uh, the debt structure every uh, couple of years to put it off. And this plan uh, deals with that. John, I, I, we've been describing this as the anti-Big Dig plan, bottom line, because of the transparency you have laid out in front of you a 10-year pro forma on how we're going to pay for this. And in fact, one of the reasons why we're in this mess is because since the mid-1990s, we've been paying for 
our operations off the state credit card so we need to get off that uh, but we think that this plan the governor's asked us to and the lieutenant governor to propose is one that's transparent and specific about how what, how much we need to pay for it over the next decade. But part of the vision that you just laid out has multi-billion dollar expansion projects in it. And we saw in the big dig how those, those price tags exploded on us and got us in trouble. What guarantee do we have that won't happen again? Well, I guess I, what I would say is we've got uh, um, really to build on what the Secretary just said, um, an unprecedented level of transparency both in the plan and in the operations of MassDOT today. There are a lot of people who have a stake uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the problem uh, of, the, of the big dig and the escalating costs. I will say um, as a matter of pride for me in our team, that the projects that we have been doing over the last uh, six years have, I think, almost to a one come in under budget uh, and, uh, and on time, if not, if not early. It turns out, um, not to get too much in the weeds, it's a pretty good time to be doing capital uh, projects because there is so much capacity out there that, uh, uh, that, we, can, uh, that we can draw on. Um, but clearly, you know, there ought to be in place um, mechanisms by which there are regular check-ins with the legislature and the and the public on the progress against this uh, and the, against this plan, and there there are uh, um, uh, there are lots of um, uh, milestones um, in the pro forma uh, that would be natural check-in points for that. And I would just say to, to buttress that, you look at the Fast 14 project, an incredibly complicated project. Uh, under budget and on time. The accelerated bridge program, I believe 90% of the bridges are uh, on time and 80% below cost. As we have engaged in the various transportation bond bills that Secretary Davey uh, outlined in the PowerPoint, uh, it's been with the legislature working on a, a pay-as-you-go approach. And throughout that course, the state's bond rating has improved. So I think that is also part of the conversation with the public, that reform before revenue, we brought these efficiencies to bear, we'll continue to seek them out, but as the Secretary laid out, what we currently have is not sustainable. And if we are gonna grow as a Commonwealth, there are regions of the state which were starved as a result of the big dig that deserve investments if we're gonna grow the economies in those regions as well. So just in terms of uh, the way the funding would work, you're asking or proposing a, a $1.02 billion annual investment for the next 10 years, but that is going to cover a whole host of things, including a $13 billion 10-year capital investment and ending the practice of borrowing to pay for operations, funding the RTAs. I, I am having trouble, I'm not very good at math, but I'm having trouble making those numbers add up. So if we have $1.02 billion a year in new revenue, uh, the plan is going to cost quite a bit more than that. So how, how does that work? Can you square that for me? You find, you're sure, you finance the projects over a 25-year basis. So we're looking at it strictly over a 10-year for operations and for capital, um, certainly to finance a $13 billion uh, program that will cost more than in the 10 years. We're going to finance it over a 25-year uh, basis. And so I guess I'm wondering at the culmination of those 10 years, how much debt would you, be, would you expect would be lingering that would then require some sort of new attention? Um, would not require new attention, it's paid for. So as the debt we talked about rolls off uh, the books, there's opportunity uh, for improved. So for example, when we take the employees off the capital bond program, $250 million now paid for by revenue, that's $250 million a year we can now spend on capital, rightfully so, right? Um, but the bottom line is no, the capital program is paid over a 25 year period. Anybody in the way back, Peter? Hang on one second. The one, two, three, four, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Governor, um, I'm wondering how specific your um, preferred uh, funding proposal will be when you lay it out in the state of the state, and also is it safe to say that those ideas will be ideas that are contained within this menu, or might you have another idea that isn't in this? I do that from time to time, don't I? Uh, no, this, this plan, I think, is the right uh, plan substantively. I'm going to talk about um, both the principles and some specific uh, approaches in the state of the Commonwealth, and then very, very specific in the budget next week. 
Who is number two? Governor, uh, the uh, 17 meetings around the state that you say a lot of these uh, advanced ideas came from, I monitored a lot of them, and a lot of them had many of the people in this room. My question is, if people are telling you that they want these advancements, they want these big programs, um, did you ask them at that time whether or not they're willing to pay for them and how much they'd be willing to pay for them and how important they are to them? So the answer is in those hearings in particular, I don't think there was a person in the room of the thousand or so people that showed up who didn't understand we had to uh, find a way to pay for it. And our plan uh, outlines, as Andy mentioned, uh, a menu of options, most of which we heard from our customers. So again, um, you know, we're going to get into the more detail later, but the menu outlined in the plan were specific ideas or approaches that were suggested. Um, by some of uh, those who spoke, and at the very end of the plan are the comments that we received um, at those hearings. Let me just, uh, let me Can I just ask though, it was, it was, but I mean, there wasn't a price tag of $1 billion a year at those meetings. Now people know this is what it's going to cost. Right. And um, I should also say that um, this plan isn't just the culmination or the accumulation of every idea in every one of those hearings. There were choices made. Um, and in the case of the expansion projects, which represent about 20 percent of that $1 billion, um, the, uh, uh, the choices were made in favor of those projects that have a big uh, economic impact, uh, a big economic pickup uh, that are about reaching the economic opportunities in parts of the Commonwealth that have been, uh, that have been cut off. So the conversation uh, that we've been having with the, uh, with the public is iterative. It's supposed to be. Um, first is to come up with the, uh, with the plan, then to propose our means of, uh, of paying for it. And I, am, I have no doubt that when we get into this uh, debate, provided it is, uh, is fact-based, then we will land in a good place for the Commonwealth. Did you have a question as well? And Peter, you were four, right? So, yeah, go ahead. Hang on one sec, almost. Uh, speaking of jobs, uh, did I hear something about uh, subway cars being built in Massachusetts? Can you elaborate on that at all? Okay. Um, so the answer is you did hear that, Bob. I'm glad you're listening. Um, you know, one way uh, we're able to look at that is with federal funds, which is typically how the T procures uh, vehicles, we're not allowed by federal rules to prescribe that the manufacturing be in Massachusetts. Uh, the state, with the state paying for the car procurement, we can make those uh, requirements, and our intent is to do that, to require the manufacturing, the final assembly, um, or some such done here in the Commonwealth. It's an enormous order. It's almost a billion dollars in vehicles that we need, um, and they're typically manufactured in places like Boise, Idaho, or uh, upstate New York, or, you know, in the case of our commuter rail coaches right now, Philadelphia. Why not? Why not have them be built here in the state? I want to say, I want to say something about the BMU as well. Uh, you want to, to, let me just ask the secretary to say something about the BMUs, which is pretty exciting to uh, build off on that idea. Uh, so one other item that the governor asked us to do was to really look more creatively in how we use our current infrastructure. So for folks who know transit really well, this DMU service is not uh, new. But for, let me just quickly explain. A DMU is essentially uh, a subway, self-propelled subway car, if you will that we can run on commuter rail. So for example, on the Fairmont line, um, which is the line that's fully contained here in the city of Boston, we run large, very bulky, and sometimes empty commuter rail coaches up and down. Uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility. We would be able to run more frequent service up and down the Fairmont line uh, with subway-like cars at a lower cost. And it allows us, frankly, to do things um, that the, I think the urban rig envisions, to be able to run subway-like service um, out to places like uh, Bright, New Brighton Landing. When that's completed, we could run service to Beverly on a shuttle where we have significant parking, for example, Salem the same. So it just is another flexible tool uh, and a low-cost tool to be able to really um, provide better service for our customers, both in the core of the city and also some targeted uh, regions outside of Boston. Governor, I know you said uh, dedicated, competitive, um, and I've lost the third word. Comprehensive. Uh, comprehensive. As you're thinking about a uh, combination of tax and fee and toll increases, can you say a little more about how you will decide this is fair and just and can earn majority support in the legislature? 
Well, I, you know what, those principles are important. Um, comprehensive, as I said, because I think we, you have to stop just focusing on patches and plugs and how we really create uh, the platform for growth, not just in the greater Boston area, but, uh, but common, uh, commonwealth-wide that uh, a modern transportation system will bring. Dedicated because I think it's enormously important that we have a discipline about this over time, over time. Two years from now, this team is replaced by a different team. Well, two of this team are replaced by, uh, uh, by a different team. And, uh, and there, will be, there will be new priorities, new ideas. There always are. Um, the question is, how do we assure that we sustain these investments over time? Because it will take some time to get us that 21st century, uh, that 21st century uh, system. And competitive because I think as we look at all of our um, tax rates and fees, we should be conscious of what's happening elsewhere in the, in the region and what's happening in the, in the states with which, we, uh, which we, with which we compete. And you know, not to get too deep in the, um, in the weeds, um, but uh, it would take a tripling of the, of the uh, gas tax um, to, fund this, uh, to fund this plan. It would put us way out of uh, sync from, uh, from our competitor states in the region and nationally for that, uh, uh, for that matter. So that's not on the top of my, of my list, for example. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, Mayor Kirk from Gloucester. And I just want to point out a, a one piece of that plan which makes so much sense, and that is that increase in Chapter 90. There's nothing worse than coming off a beautifully paved state road only to hit that potholed street in a city. So I think we need to talk about the value to every citizen, no matter what type of transportation node that they're using. Um, but roads, certainly in our local communities, are very, very important. So I thank you for including that. And I look forward to uh, the funding proposals for this comprehensive plan. Thank you. The uh, Mayor Holiday from Newburyport. The other piece that I wanted to thank you for, which was not part of your uh, presentation, was for consolidating all of the very, very difficult programs into one Mass Works grant program, which was uh, a tremendous asset for not that Newburyport has received one yet, we'll keep trying over the next several years, but it really has been a, a much better way. I guess the point. I guess. No, but. <laughs> But it has been a much better way for municipalities to reach out and be able to submit uh, one grant program as opposed to things sitting on tips for 15 years and never getting funded. Right. It was very, very important, I think, for municipalities Thank for you, you to redo that process. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. And thanks to the legislature for supporting that. Anybody else? Everybody all right in the back? I can't see from all the lights. Hmm? Can you see some? Okay, great. Thank you all for coming.